This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Hi, good evening. Welcome. Uh, my name is Juan Kim. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Medicine here at UCSF. And uh, as a member of the Division of Hematology and Oncology, I take care of patients who have gender urinary cancers, which include kidney cancers, bladder cancers, and prostate cancers. And here, today I'm here to talk to you about renal cell carcinoma. So before I begin, I'd like to always start with a little bit of history. Um, I doubt any of you know who these people are, but this is uh, on the left is Eugene von Hippel and on the right is Avrin Lindau. And these folks describe the syndrome of vascular tumors in the central nervous system, the pancreas, the adrenal glands, and the kidneys, including renal cell carcinoma. And this is now known as von Hippel-Lindau disease. And von Hippel-Lindau disease is caused by a chromosomal abnormality, a genetic uh, defect in the von Hippel-Lindau gene, which is found on chromosome number three. And the reason that's relevant is because um, most renal cell carcinomas have that same defect in that chromosome. And we're going to swing back to that later on when we talk a little bit about the biology of the disease and the current therapies that are available for the treatment of renal cell carcinoma. So renal cell carcinoma make up about 80 to 85 percent of all kidney cancers. So it's the most common type of kidney cancers uh, that we find. And there are multiple subtypes of renal cell carcinoma. And this includes clear cell, papillary, chromophobe, oncocytic, collecting duct, and unclassified renal cell carcinomas. And clear cell is the most common type, and it occurs in about 75 to 85% of cases. And as you can see, the rest of the types of renal cell carcinomas are much less frequent. And so uh, a lot of the talk is going to be focused on the clear cell subtype, but we will touch on uh, some of these other subtypes as well. So just to get into depth about renal cell carcinoma first, the demographics. Um, there are about 64,000 new cases in the United States each year, and renal cell carcinoma causes about 14,000 deaths uh, in the U.S. each year. As a comparison, lung cancer, in lung cancer, there are about 225,000 new cases in the U.S. each year, and it causes about 160,000 deaths. So uh, lung cancer clearly is a much more common disease, um, but RCC itself causes um, uh, quite a burden of disease for those afflicted. It occurs more commonly in men than women by about 50 percent, and the median age for those diagnosed with RCC is about 64 years. The extent of the disease, uh, extent of the disease at time of diagnosis varies. So um, in 60 percent of the time, uh, at the time of diagnosis, uh, the, the cancer is confined to the kidney. In 20 percent of the time, approximately, it's confined to the kidney and the regional lymph nodes. And by regional, it's those lymph nodes immediately surrounding the kidney. And unfortunately, about 20% of cases, it's actually metastatic at the time of diagnosis, meaning that it's already spread to another organ or to distant lymph node sites. There are some established risk factors to RCC. Smoking is probably the most common and most established cause of RCC, but also hypertension. Obesity is known as a risk factor. Chronic kidney disease, particularly those that cause cystic diseases of kidney, is a risk factor as well. There's a question of whether toxic exposure can also uh, be a causative uh, a risk factor in uh, patients with RCC. Analgesics, such as Tylenol, aspirin, and NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen, 
It's also seen as a risk factor for, for developing RCC, particularly the chronic use of these drugs. Sickle cell disease causes a particular type of uh, kidney cancer called renal medullary cancers and hereditary traits. And as I mentioned earlier, patients with uh, uh, genetic diseases such as von Hippel-Lindau disease um, can uh, have RCC as well. So this is kind of a typical story, or what we like to think is a typical story of somebody who comes in to see us with a diagnosis of RCC. So a 65-year-old man with a 30-year history of smoking who has right side of flank pain, bleeding on urination, and a palpable mass. And those three things, right, a flank pain, bleeding on urination, and palpable mass is considered a cl classic triad of symptoms for RCC. However, this classic triad occurs in only about 10% of patients who present with RCC. So although we call it classic, it's not all that common. So, what are other ways that patients with RCC present on diagnosis? And it can cause leg swelling, um, and that's when the, the veins that drain the legs can be obstructed by extension of the tumor into the central vein in the body called the IVC or in, in vera vena cava. In men, it can actually cause scrotal swelling, and weight loss is also a, a common presenting symptom in patients who have RCC. And there are other signs or symptoms as well, Anemia, or low red blood cell count, is a common presenting symptom. Or erythrocytosis, which is a high red cell, uh, blood cell count, can also occur. And that's because RCC can produce erythropoietin, or EPO. So if you uh, follow sports and things like cycling, for example, often athletes dope with EPO. And it is because it increases their uh, red blood cell count and allows them to carry more oxygen. Hypercalcemia, or high calcium levels in the blood, can be a, a symptom of RCC as well. Fevers due to cancer, and we call that tumor fever. Without having infection or other commonly thought of reasons for fevers, people can just have fevers due to the tumor itself, and that's usually due to production of cytokines and other inflammatory uh, markers that the cancer can cause. High alkaline phosphatase. So alkaline phosphatase is most often found in the liver or in the bone. So people who have liver disease can have elevated alkaline phosphatase, for example. In the case of a syndrome called Stauffer syndrome, people can have no evidence of uh, uh, liver disease, yet have an elevated alkaline phosphatase level. And it's, it's not really clear exactly what, uh, why that happens, but that's something that can be seen in some cases as well. Amyloidosis uh, is a condition where abnormal proteins that are produced as part of a, a variety of diseases, cancers, autoimmune diseases, can deposit itself into organs in an abnormal way, including the heart, and cause organ dysfunction and organ failure. These are considered to be paraneoplastic syndromes, so they're not due to any direct effect of the tumor itself as it the tumor is spreading into, into an organ or the tumor is compressing a vessel, not a direct effect of the tumor, but a syndrome that the cancer causes as a part of its presentation. More RCCs are be, uh, being discovered incidentally without symptoms at all, actually. And the reason for this is the availability of imaging, imaging technology such as MRI and CAT scan. So somebody might be getting a CAT scan for gallstones, for example, or appendicitis so they're being worked up for something else, and incidentally, uh, RCC is found in the kidney. Uh, and that's done, what that's done is basically uh, move the, the, the diagnosis and therefore the staging upon diagnosis of RCC into an earlier stage. So more RCCs are, are, uh, are being caught earlier, which allows for uh, more definitive treatment for those cases in which uh, they're found incidentally. So on a scan, um, these are what normal kidneys look like, one on each side. And on the, uh, on the right here, you see this large abnormal kidney that's indicative of uh, RCC, and that's what they look like on CAT scans. So when people uh, present uh, with RCC, uh, they undergo a st standard staging workup to figure out what stage of disease they have, and we're gonna talk about the staging itself in a second. But the way we would figure that out usually is through CT scans of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. For some people, uh, we get MRIs, particularly if they can not tolerate the contrast associated with CTs if they have abnormal kidney function. Depending on the patient, we also consider bone scans. Uh, if somebody has a lot of bone pain and you're suspicious uh, for bone metastasis, 
brain imaging if they're having symptoms that are concerning for brain metastasis. And in some cases, we actually examine their urine if we're concerned that there's uh, the lesion is protruding into the, uh, uh, the collecting uh, system of the kidneys. And sometimes when we're actually considering that this may be a different type of kidney cancer. These are not part of the stand, considered a standard workup, but we do that, we do them in select cases. So with cancer, tissue diagnosis is always the issue. Um, and uh, I trained uh, at, in New York, and uh, my boss at Memorial Sloan Kettering years ago always told me it's not cancer until you prove it cancer with a tissue diagnosis. Um, but in RCC, because of this classic radiographic appearance, Many times, we don't actually do an initial biopsy uh, to uh, establish the diagnosis. And actually, in many cases, the diagnosis is usually made by actually doing the, the, the treatment, which is a radical or a partial nephrectomy. So let me just show you that real quick here. So let's say this is a person with kidney cancer. You have a kidney on each side. Here are your central blood vessels, the aorta and the IVC here. Um, and here's uh, the, you collect the urine in each kidney through the ureter, which then empties into the bladder. So a radical nephrectomy is when you take out the entire kidney. As you can see here, you, you ligate these blood vessels and you remove the entire kidney and the ureter along with it and you take the whole thing out, okay? Or a partial nephrectomy, if the tumor is small and amenable to a partial surgery, what you do is you actually cut around the tumor you remove the tumor, and you can actually sew the kidney back up and help that patient preserve uh, the remainder of the, what you think is the normal kidney. And these, are, these will both get us a diagnosis because we can get the tissue to look under the microscope to make sure that it is RCC. But also, depending on the stage, this could be the definitive treatment and hopefully cure for patients who have RCC. This is how we do our staging. Um, it's the TNM system. So T is, stands for tumor size, N stands for lymph node status, and M stands for metastasis. A simple way to look at this is through pictures. So stage one is when um, patients' tumors are confined to the kidney, and it is uh, less than seven centimeters. Stage two is when, again, the cancer is confined to the kidney. Um, but it's greater than seven centimeters. Stage three is when the kidney tumor extends into this vessel, the IVC, the renal vein is here and then, then into the IVC, or regional lymph nodes immediately surrounding the kidney. And then stage four is when the kidney tumor actually directly uh, invades adjacent organs or spreads to lymph nodes that are distant and far away, or it actually travels through the blood vessels and travels distantly. So stage four is the most advanced form of the kidney cancer. For patients who have stage one, two, or three uh, disease, um, those people can be definitively treated by surgery, as I described earlier, either by a radical or a partial nephrectomy. Patients with stage four disease, surgery is still a part of their therapy in, in many cases, but those patients are not going to, usually not going to be cured by surgery alone, and that's important. And the staging is most important, not because we can look at these nice pictures, but because of the implication for the prognosis and treatment of those patients who are so diagnosed. So to delve into that a little bit deeper, this is a stage-based survival in patients with renal cell carcinoma. So as you, in the red is stage one, in blue is stage two, in yellow is stage three, and in green here is stage four, and these are the proportion of patients who survive over zero, one, two, three, four, and five years after diagnosis. And as you can see, stage one and stage two patients do pretty well, where at five years, for stage one disease, the survival rate is over 80%. And for stage two disease, the survival is nearly 75%. As you move on to stage three patients, and let me just go back to the picture here. Stage three patients are now where the cancer is spreading in through the vasculature. Those patients only have a five-year survival rate of about 50%. So half these patients are diagnosed with stage three uh, die by five years. 
If you have stage four disease, so distant metastasis and uh, direct invasion and distant lymph node metastasis, you can see that less than 10% of patients are alive at 10 years. And in fact, more than half of patients are, uh, die within the year of diagnosis. So the staging makes a huge difference in terms of the patient's prognosis. There are other ways to look at prognosis as well, and this is uh, the UCLA integrated staging system. This includes the TNM stage as part of its prognostic uh, determination. It also looks at the Furman grade. The Furman grade is how aggressive a cancer looks like under the microscope. And Furman grade goes from one to four, one being a very indolent appearing cancer, Furman grade four being a very aggressive looking cancer under the microscope. The ECOG PS is the ECOG performance status. So the ECOG performance status is a scale that we use to determine a patient's functional status. A ECOG zero basically means you're a normal functioning person with no limitations on their uh, activity. ECOG five means actually is equivalent to death. So ECOG four is somebody whose uh, functional status is incredibly impaired. And by combining the TNM stage, which I just showed you, the Furman grade, and the ECOG performance status, you can actually divide patients into five prognostic groups, and you can look at their survival rates. As you can see, if you're UIS as stage one, so these are our TNM stage one patients with low firming grade with excellent performance status, their two-year survival is 96%, and their five-year survival is 94%. So again, these patients do very well. On the other end, if you're stage five on this UCLA scale, that means you have stage four disease, bad disease as, uh, as can be uh, seen by the Furman grade, and then one or higher ECOG performance status. Then the two-year survival is less than 10%, and nearly no patient survived at the five-year mark. So again, this is that same chart basically in graphic form, where again, the group one patients do very well and the group five patients don't do very well at all. And there's this very, very significant difference between each of these groups. So you can basically stratify these patients and you can give patients relatively um, informative information about how they're gonna do after their diagnosis of their RCC. So going back to that initial uh, stage-based survival patients, uh, survival in patients with RCC, as I mentioned before, it's really these, starting with these stage three patients where you know, they're not doing very well, and obviously stage four patients were not doing well at all. And if you look at these stage three patients, and even the stage one and two patients, because clearly a proportion of these patients are dying from their kidney cancer, you, know, you have to wonder about, one, why they're dying, and then two, can you do anything about it? And not all of these patients are dying because of their uh, recurrent kidney cancer, but clearly, many of them are experiencing recurrence of their disease and dying from RCC. So, you know, one of the questions we, we've been asking for a very long time is for these patients, particularly here with stage one through three disease, is there anything you can do to reduce the risk of recurrence? And is there anything you can do to therefore, by reducing the rates of recurrence, um, improve their survival rates? And the answer is, not really, and there's no role for adjuvant therapy at this time. So adjuvant therapy is therapy that follows surgery. So as I told you before, as part of staging, people undergo scans and undergo their surgery for their kidney cancer to come up with their stage. And if you feel that somebody has high-risk disease, you know, we always get the question, you know, whether they should start taking medicines, even if, they, if we feel that they had a complete resection to reduce a chance that the kidney cancer comes back. And multiple studies have been done um, uh, using different agents, immunotherapies and such things, where all the trials are negative in terms of being able to reduce recurrence risk and to improve survival. Currently, there are multiple ongoing clinical trials to further address this question of adjuvant therapy, so therapy following surgery in order to reduce the rate of recurrence. Uh, a study using these agents ha has completed a quarrel and we are expecting results shortly. A study, an adjuvant trial using this agent um, closed late last year to accrual, and we should be getting results in the next few years. And the study using this agent, Everolimus, is ongoing and currently accruing patients. Um, and, you know, 
with other cancers, so for example with lung cancer or breast cancer, adjuvant therapy has been very effective in reducing recurrence rates, improving cure rates, and improving survival. And again, with kidney cancer, we haven't had that type of success. So I've gone through quite a few things here, so I'm going to do a quick interim summary before we move on to our next section. So as I mentioned, RCC is the most common uh, kidney cancer, and the clear cell type, making up about 75 to 85 percent of RCC, is the most common type of RCC. Uh, at the time of diagnosis, 60 percent is confined to the kidney. Those are the stage one and stage two patients and therefore have excellent prognoses. But unfortunately, 20 percent of patients have metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis, and those are the patients who have the poorest prognoses. Uh, established risk factors for RCC include smoking, obesity, hypertension, use of pain meds, and hereditary traits. And in terms of symptoms for patients who present with RCC, the classic triad of flank pain, hematuria, and palpable mass occur only 10 percent of the time. And more and more patients are uh, being discovered to have RCC incidentally. The TNM staging system uh, gives prognostic information, and the UCLA International Staging System is uh, another way uh, to uh, look at prognostic information for people who have RCC. The definitive treatment for patients with stage one through uh, three disease is surgery, either a radical for people with large tumors or partial nephrectomy if the tumor is small and you can spare the rest of the kidney. And for those patients who have stage one through th three disease, even if we feel that may, they may be at a high risk for recurrence, there's currently no role for adjuvant therapy following surgery, although multiple studies are going on and hopefully will more definitively answer that question. So now we're going to uh, talk more about stage four disease. And these are the patients who um, experience the greatest burden from their disease. These are the patients who have the worst prognoses. Um, but even within stage four patients, um, you, can, you can try to look at additional prognostic factors to see, well, which of these stage four patients have the worst prognoses and which of these patients have the best prognoses. So we're going to talk about the prognostic factors in a second. We're also going to talk about the role of surgery in these patients. In some cancers, patients with metastatic disease are not necessarily given the option of surgery because it's thought that once they have systemic disease, surgery is not really going to help them. Kidney cancer is a little bit different, and there may be a role for nep nephrectomy, removing the diseased kidney, or even metastatectomy, which is removing metastatic lesions by surgery in some of these patients. We're going to talk a little bit about immunotherapy and systemic therapy for patients who have RCC, metastatic RCC. At the end, we're going to talk just a touch about the non-clear cell disease. As I mentioned, there are other types of RCC. So we're going to come back to the same chart again. And as I mentioned, patients with stage 4 disease have uh, extremely poor prognoses. But not all of these patients are the same. I always tell patients that they're all like a snowflake. They're all like incredibly different. And we need, we need more uh, uh, clarity in, in, in about the patient in front of us, not just a group of patients. So folks at the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, developed these prognostic factors, which are poor performance status, elevated serum lactate dehydrogenase uh, level, that's an enzyme that's found in the blood, uh, hypercalcemia or high calcium levels, anemia or low blood count, and the absence of a nephrectomy. And if you have zero of these five things, then you're considered to be favorable. If you have more than three of these things, or three or more of these things, then you're, found, uh, you're thought to be a poor uh, prognosis, and then one or two is considered intermediate. And by looking at these five prognostic factors, you can actually separa separate out the, the, these groups in terms of their prognosis. So people who are favorable, so have none of these five factors, do better than the people who have three or more of these factors, as you can see here. Then there's the Hank criteria, which is a, a very similar. And they look at, again, poor performance status, short time from diagnosis to needing systemic therapy, anemia, hypercalcemia, leukocytosis, which is a high white count, 
thrombocytosis, which is a high platelet count. And again, it's very similar. Zero is considered favorable, one to two is considered intermediate, and greater than three is considered poor prognosis. And again, these are only for people who have stage four disease. And as you can see, two years after starting whatever therapy they did for their kidney cancer, if you're in the favorable group, so you had none of these things, then 75% of these people are alive. However, if you're in the poor uh, prognosis group, then only 7% are alive. And then intermediate is smack in the middle. So even for these poor prognosis patients, there are patients who do well, and then there are the patients who do very poorly. And again, these, pro these additional prognostic factors help us sort that information out, and we can provide better information to our patient about their prognosis. As I mentioned earlier, um, with kidney cancer, there may be a role for nephrectomy uh, or removal of the kidney, despite the fact that they have stage four disease. So one of the things that has been noted, interestingly, in patients with kidney cancer is that sometimes, so let's say you have a patient and they have kidney cancer, they have a mass in the kidney, and you scan them and you see lung metastasis indicating their kidney cancer has spread to the lungs and maybe even to other areas. And you go in and you do the nephrectomy, so you remove the kidney. You don't do anything, you don't give them any medicines, you don't touch the lung lesions. Yet after their nephrectomy, their lung lesions will spontaneously shrink in size and sometimes even dis disappear. Now, it's not a common thing to happen. It's actually in very, very rare. However, that, ga that gives us a hint that in some patients, the nephrectomy can be actually extremely helpful. And that's actually the first thing that pointed to the role of the immune system in kidney cancer. And we're going to come back to that a little bit later. And this, even in patients where there is, there is not this regression of metastasis, it's, nephrectomy by itself seems to improve survival prior to immune therapy. And again, the role of the immune therapy what, and what it does is important there. But if you just look at this chart here, in black, the solid line here are patients who had immunotherapy alone. And on the right here, in the kind of the broken line, are patients who had surgery plus the immune therapy. And as you can see, there's a significant improvement in the survival for patients who had surgery, despite the fact that they had metastatic disease. So in patients who are amenable for surgery, who are healthy enough for surgery, whose kidney cancers are not so advanced that you know, they are resectable by surgery, we want to take as many of these patients to surgery as possible, again, despite the fact that they have metastatic disease, because we do think that it improves outcomes. And again, that's not true for many other cancers out there. If you have lung cancer that's metastatic to other places, we don't usually resect lung cancer. Same thing with prostate cancer. Um, so this is, a, this is a very different thing about RCC. And in metastatic RCC, there's also a potential role for metastatectomy. So again, it's rarely curative, but some patients benefit. And most commonly, these are done for lymph nodes or people who have pulmonary metastasis. And we strongly consider complete resection whenever possible, regardless of whether it's in the kidney or if it's metastatic. And again, in RCC, patients who are able to have even metastatic lesions completely resected seem to benefit. And so if you look at, let's say, this patient who has a single pulmonary metastasis, it is very strongly uh, uh, recommended, if they're otherwise healthy, that we go in and re resect that mass. It may not cure them, and their kidney cancer might come back, but it, prolong, it may prolong their disease-free interval. It may uh, prolong the time or, uh, or extend the time before they need to be on any systemic therapy and hopefully help patients live longer. Now, if you're this patient, unfortunately, with multiple lung metastases like this, obviously this is a very difficult to resect disease. Short of removing the lungs themselves, you're not going to be able to resect them. So that's probably an unresectable patient. But for patients with single metastases or uh, just a few metastatic lesions, we consider uh, surgery very strongly in those patients. And finally, uh, we need to talk about systemic therapy. So the traditional chemotherapies are not very effective in kidney cancer. So uh, in renal cell carcinoma, and when I say a traditional chemotherapy, I'm talking about you know what you're imagining, which is sitting in an infusion chair with an IV in the arm, with a bag dripping in with medicines, and for whatever reason, kidney cancer just has never really responded very much to chemotherapy. 
So I mentioned, I alluded to earlier that there may be a role for immunotherapy um, in patients uh, with kidney cancer. There's something called anti-VEGF therapy, mTOR inhibition therapy, and all of these therapies are FDA approved for the treatment of uh, metastatic RCC. And we're gonna talk about each of these things. First, we're gonna to touch on immunotherapy. So interferon alpha um, was one of the first agents ever used to treat kidney cancer. It basically stimulates the immune system. It activates uh, cells of the immune system called macrophages and NK cells. And the idea here is that when you receive interferon alpha, it stimulates your own immune system to go after kidney cancer cells. It's, it's limited in terms of its efficacy used as a monotherapy, so used alone. There's only about a 7% response rate when used as a single therapy. However, there seems to be a greater benefit when it's combined with an anti-VEGF drug called bevacizumab. Bevacizumab is an antibody that's, that targets something called VEGF. Um, VEGF is one of the, uh, the signals uh, that are upregulated in people who have RCC because of the whole defect in the von Hippel-Lindau gene. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, too. Um, so when used in combination, there does seem to be a benefit. So interferon alpha combined with bevacizumab is a, is a FDA-approved option for patients who have RCC. Now, the issue there is that we don't know what's doing what. We don't know what part of the benefit is coming from bevacizumab, and we don't know what part of it is coming from interferon alpha. Another option for immunotherapy that's currently approved for use is interleukin-2. So interleukin-2 is a naturally occurring cytokine that, again, stimulates the immune system. And this time, it stimulates the T cell component of the immune system. IL-2 is approved at high doses. Um, and if you think about it, you know, your immune system is not supposed to be turned on and stimulated all the time. It's supposed to be active when your body needs it and turned off when your body doesn't. So when you turn on your immune system artificially, you know, again, the idea is that you stimulate the immune system to go after the kidney cancer. But if you stimulate it too much, then it's going to also maybe go after you. And so it is an extremely uh, toxic therapy. And some of the side effects associated with high-dose interleukin-2 are things like kidney failure, liver failure, people have been seen to go into comas, uh, respiratory failure. So it actually requires that the patient get admitted to the intensive care unit even before you begin therapy. And this is the curve um, where in the dotted arm here, these are patients who are treated with regular doses of IL-2, interleukin-2, and the interferon that I showed on the previous page. And then in the solid line here, are patients uh, who are treated with the high-dose interleukin-2. And if you actually just look at this, glance over it, this isn't actually very impressive. You can see that the response rates and survival rates for these patients are low. But what's interesting is, it, in patients who are treated with high-dose IL-2, there's this very small population of patients. It's less than 10%, somewhere between 5 and 10%, probably closer to 5, that just after 1, 2, 3, 4, by six, and now we have follow-up to eight to 10 years, their metastatic kidney cancer is gone, and it's not coming back. And we call that a durable, complete response. And it's, again, a very small population of patients, but these patients in a disease that I told you about 10% are alive at a year to two years, these patients are alive at six years and more. And so, Given its toxicity, though, we don't always use high-dose IL-2 in everybody. Unfortunately, there are people who are in their 20s and 30s and 40s who are very, very young who are diagnosed with metastatic RCC. And if they're otherwise healthy for these young patients, uh, it certainly is a treatment option that we consider. Um, and even in older patients who are in good shape and who don't have a lot of comorbidities, who don't have heart disease and kidney disease and things like that, we do consider uh, uh, high-dose IL-2 in those patients as well. Um, typically, somewhere between 50 and 60 is kind of the cutoff. Beyond 60, I don't think we ever do high-dose IL-2 because of its toxicity. In fact, while it causes durable, complete responses in 5 to 10% of patients, about 5% of patients die directly due to complications from high-dose IL-2, not even from the kidney cancer. They're going to die from the therapy. So again, 
while it's very, very promising for this very small select group of patients, um, it's not a therapy for everyone. Now we're going to talk about the um, anti-VEGF therapies. So VEGF is a is a, uh, a factor that's critical for maintaining blood supply. Now this is in the body in general, but kidney cancer actually takes advantage of uh, VEGF to keep itself alive. So we're going to come back to this whole von Hippel-Lindau story. So this. This is the von Hippel-Lindau protein, let's say, um, which is produced by the von Hippel-Lindau gene. And typically what it does is in the presence of oxygen, it binds this thing called HIF-alpha, binds it, and then it basically destroys HIF-alpha. You don't want a lot of this stuff in the system. What happens is when you have mutations or for some reason you lose the von Hippel-Lindau gene as you do in the majority, great majority of patients who have RCC, since you can't go down this pathway, the levels of HIF-alpha go up. And when HIF-alpha goes up, it binds with HIF-beta to bind DNA in various locations to induce the production of these uh, proteins, including VEGF, PDGF-beta, TGF-alpha, and EPO. These are all pro-survival pathways, so cancers when, they, when these factors are overproduced, have an easier time surviving, basically. And so this is one of the mechanisms by which RCCs may keep itself alive and progress. So anti-VEGF are meant to block this. And uh, because VEGF has a lot of off-target effect, or anti-VEGF therapies have a lot of off-target effect, it may block some of these other factors as well. So that's how these anti-VEGF therapies work. So multiple agents have been approved. So bevacizumab, as I mentioned earlier, has been approved uh, for use in combination with one of the immunotherapies, interferon alpha. And then there are a whole bunch of what are called tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And there are four that are currently approved for use in RCC patients, sunitinib, sorafenib, pazopinib, and excitinib. As you can see, they all have the same kind of ending. Um, and tyrosine kinases are incredibly important for normal body function. There are, there are lots and lots and lots of tyrosine kinase inhibitors in the body. The problem with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or TKIs, is that they're dirty. And what I mean by that is, so this is what's called a kinome. So each of these lines indicate a tyrosine kinase. And each of these red dots indicate that, in this example, sunitinib, and in this example, pazopinib, blocks those tyrosine kinases. And the problem with that is a lot of them are required for normal function, normal bodily function. So the dirtier they are, the more normal function they inhibit, and they can lead to a lot of side effects. And so again, I told you about the toxic effects of IL-2. These tend not to be as bad, and for the most part, are some of the life-threatening things that can happen with IL-2. But for this reason, tyrosine kinase inhibitors can cause quite a bit of side effects in patients who are on them. Um, finally, in terms of systemic therapies, we have mTOR inhibitors. So mTOR is another kinase. Again, it's, it's an enzyme that's needed for, in many cases, for normal body function. So mTOR is a multifunction kinase. It does a lot of different things, mostly helping with survival of cells, cell growth, proliferation, motility, cell survival, protein synthesis. In RCC, it's super activated, abnormally activated, and does more than it's supposed to do. So one of the, one of the consequences we think when mTOR is abnormally uh, activated is that it promotes cell, and in this case, tumor survival. Um, and so uh, RCs can grow, it can spread, right, motility, so it can go to other places. So it, it contributes to, to the uh, pathogenesis of RCC. So if you block the mTOR pathway, we think that, again, that can be effective in patients who have kidney cancer. The issue with mTOR inhibitors is that they have modest efficacy, and in general, they may not be as good as the TKIs, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, 
And also because, again, these are multifunction kin kinase inhibitors that, again, have a role in normal body function. They do, again, cause a lot of side effects. And in my experience, anyway, the mTOR inhibitors tend to cause even more side effects than the TKIs do. So we're going to summarize the different treatment options and what we talked about. And basically, uh, the way um, I'm going to separate this is for treatment-naive patients, so patients with stage 4 disease uh, at diagnosis who have not yet received any kind of systemic therapy. And remember, we talked about this favorable or intermediate risk and poor risk patients that we can even divide within stage four what kind of uh, progno uh, prognosis they have. And then we're going to talk, we're going to also talk about patients who already had some sort of therapy who need the next line of therapy. And that first therapy could have been the immune therapy or could have been some sort of uh, VEGF or TKI therapy. So. The first uh, uh, drug that got approved in RCC was serafinib. Serafinib is a TKI, and it was it was uh, tested in a phase three style in uh, in a phase three study in patients uh, who've had prior immunotherapy interferon, and it showed that there was a modest improvement in overall survival. In patients who were on serafinib, the overall survival was 17.8 months. In patients who were on placebo, was 15.2 months. So that was the first approved drug uh, beyond cytokine therapy in patients who have um, RCC. The next drug was sunitinib. Um, and this was tested in treatment-naive patients. Uh, and again, the, the intervention arm was sunitinib. The control arm this time was not placebo, but the interferon alpha and immunotherapy. And in this study, the overall survival for patients on sunitinib was 26.4 months versus 21.8 months in patients on interferon alpha. So sunitinib received this approval. And this occurred, I believe, in 2006. For patients with poor treatment naive uh, but were poor risk, temsorolimus was again tested against interferon alpha and it again showed a survival benefit. Uh, 10.9 months overall survival in the temsorolimus arm, 7.3 months in the interferon alpha arm. So it received a, a, a approval for treatment of poor risk patients who are treatment naive. And um, that was in 2007. The next drug was everolimus in patients who were previously treated with a TKI. Everolimus, like temsorolimus, is a um, mTOR inhibitor. It was tested against placebo. And you can see that. These patients, I mean, have a terrible prognosis. So if you're previously treated with uh, uh, TKI, you know, these, the, the survival overall, uh, I mean, this was progression-free survival. In the placebo arm was only 2.2 months. And by Everolimus, it was improved to 4.0 months. Everolimus was then approved. This is that bevacizumab and interferon alpha combination that I talked to you about earlier. And again, this looked at progression-free survival. And um, the combination versus interferon alpha alone improved progression-free survival to 10.2 months from 5.5 months. And finally, um, pizopinib, um, is it was tested against placebo, and it, it significantly improved uh, progression-free survival in patients who were treated with pizopinib versus placebo. Actually, one more. Exitinib was the most recently approved TKI for the treatment of RCC. It was tested against sorafenib uh, in patients who were previously treated. And again, it significantly improved progression-free survival in that patient population. So we often use this as kind of our map when we see patients uh, with RCC to determine what the next therapy should be. We also use this when we think about clinical, developing clinical trials to see, well, what have we done? Where do we need to particularly improve? Where do we need to focus our investigation? And talking about that, you know, I think sequencing therapy is one of the greatest challenges that we have. I mean, we have so many therapeutic options. Let's say, you know, you're in this group, you know, what do we start with? Or, you know, since a lot of these agents have not been tested against one another, how do we know which one is the best for any particular patient? So this might be one schema, you know, and this is probably what I do in clinic. Sunitinib and pizopinib, in my opinion, are the most effective, in general, for most patients, the most effective first-line therapy. So we tend to choose one of those, and we treat patients for as long as they're responding. When they experience disease progression, 
then typically, I would say I probably go to exit nib more often than the Verolimus. And then again, you treat them for as long as they respond. When they have disease progression, you might go to the other agent as third line therapy. Beyond third line therapy, uh, these drugs tend not to be very effective. Um, and at some point, the toxicities of these drugs um, probably overwhelm any potential benefit the drugs may have. And so we typically, uh, unless it's in a clinical trial setting, tend not to treat patients be, uh, beyond the third line. Um, so, but again, you know, this is kind of what I do. But other, other oncologists who treat RCC might feel differently, and their sequencing might be different. And so the optimal sequence is unknown. And you know, we think about, you know, in the, we, we call the current era the era of genomics, and we think about whether personalized genomic approaches can help us make this determination. And the problem is that we don't, we're not there yet. And you know, we might be able to sequence the DNA of a particular patient's tumor and compare it to another patient's, but the fact is a lot of times we don't know what a lot of the genetic mutations actually mean. And even if we know what they mean, we don't know how to particularly target those mutations to benefit of our patients. So we really do have a long way to go in terms of uh, genomic, uh, personalized genomic approaches for patients who have RCC. So again, we've been talking, a lot of these clinical trials that I've been going through really pertain mostly to clear cell patients. And the reason for that is because clear cell makes up 80% of patients who have RCC. But as I mentioned earlier, there are other subtypes. They probably make up 20% or less of RCC patients, but you know, we can't really forget about those folks. And if you look at the NCCN guidelines for the treatment of patients with metastatic non-clear cell RCC, this is what you see. This is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network recommendations and guidelines. And they say the recommendation is clinical trial or temsorolimus, which is mTOR inhibitor, or serafinib or sunitinib or fizopinib or exitinib or everolimus or vovacizumib or erlotinib and best supportive care. They say, you can pick any one of these things, go ahead. So as you can see, this isn't very helpful to anybody when you're trying to determine what the best therapy for patients with uh, non-clear cell RCT is. And it used to be thought, let me go back a second, that patients who have uh, non-clear uh, cell RCC fall in this poor risk category, and in general it's true, Patients who have non-clear cell ADL, uh, uh, subtype of RCC have worse outcomes than people who have clear cell. So it used to be thought that maybe temsorolimus was the best option for those patients. Recently, um, uh, last month at our uh, National um, uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting, it was shown that temsorolimus actually isn't better in those patients. Um, so the, the fact is that we actually don't know how to treat these patients the best. And so we try to you know, look at each patient. We try to look at what their comorbidities are. We try to anticipate what the side effects would be. And we try to pick the best drug for those patients that we can from our list of, of drugs. And if possible, we try to enroll them in clinical trials. Um, but you know, this, is a, this is an area, these patients who have um, non-clear cell ideologies, this is really an area of need. And it's an area where we really need to focus research uh, to try to improve the lives of those patients. So there are new therapies in clinical trials uh, for all of our patients with RCC, clear cell, non-clear cell. And probably what's most exciting right now are the new immunotherapies. So I told you earlier, interferon alpha, which is one of the immunotherapies, by itself is not all that exciting. It's approved in combination with bevacizumab, but like, you know, it's not, it's usually not our first or even our second choice for treating patients with kidney cancer. High dose IL-2 in a very small uh, uh, subset of patients is highly effective, inducing durable remissions, but the, for the majority of our patients, they don't really qualify for therapy, and it can be incredibly toxic, so it's not the most uh, uh, utilized therapy. But we know that immunotherapy has a role, and PD-1 and PDL1 inhibitors is where a lot of excitement is focused. So uh, PD-1 and PDL1 are basically uh, proteins that help regulate the activity of the immune system uh, on cancers and not cancers also, but um, as far as cancers are concerned, we think that basically the expression of those proteins on cancer cells actually cloaks cancer 
from detection from the immune system. And by blocking PD-1 and pd one, we think actually you're uncloaking cancers and you're allowing the immune system to get to the uh, cancer. And what's interesting about PD-1 and pd one inhibitors is that they're not very toxic, they're incredibly tolerable. Um, the most exciting results for PD-1 and pd one inhibitors have been in melanoma patients, and they've, been, uh, they've shown incredible responses. Um, and that's how you, immunotherapy usually goes. It actually first usually uh, goes through melanoma, and after melanoma, kidney cancer is kind of considered the next most immunotherapy responsive cancer, and then it moves on to other cancers. So um, melanoma is ahead in terms of develop in, ahead in terms of development of PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, but kidney cancer is not far behind. And there are multiple clinical ther uh, trials going on right now, seeing if PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, either by themselves or in combination with medications such as TKIs, can can help improve the course of patients uh, who have metastatic RCC. Additionally, there are multiple novel TKIs in clinical development that we think may be better than the current TKIs that we have available. One of the things that I mentioned before, sorry, I'm going to go back a little bit here, is that TKIs, some of them can be, like sunitinib, can be incredibly dirty. One of the questions is, can you make TKIs that are much more targeted so they're, they have the same efficacy that you need to fight your kidney cancer, but then don't cause as many of the side effects because it's a cleaner, it has cleaner targets. So to summarize, um, clear cell is the most common type of RCC. RCC is a curable disease, and if you have stage one through three disease, you may be cured by surgery alone. Um, for patients with metastatic disease, unlike many cancers, those patients may still be curable through surgery or in the right patients, immunotherapy, such as high-dose IL-2. But in general, metastatic RCC is not curable, and therefore we have multiple types of systemic therapy available for the treatment of these patients, including TKI, mTOR inhibitors, inhibitors and immunotherapy. And selection and sequencing of therapy is a major issue. And we really do need novel therapies that can really um, leverage the, the, the biology of kidney cancer uh, to, to treat patients and to, and to reduce the burden that this causes to, to, to the patients with the disease. So that's all. Thank you very much. Any questions? Can you repeat that? Dialysis. So the question is, is dialysis a therapy? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so the question is, you know, the role of dialysis in kidney cancer. So. Most patients who have kidney cancer actually do retain kidney function because, you know, when the kid one kidney is removed, the other kidney is still functioning. Um, so most of our patients don't need dialysis. But um, there are patients who congenitally are born with one kidney, or we actually do have patients in which case both kidneys are affected and therefore both kidneys do have to be removed. Or people who have ki chronic kidney damage when you remove one of the kidneys because of their cancer, the other one can't pick up enough of the, of the function to, uh, to really uh, take care of all the body's needs and therefore, again, need to go on dialysis. Patients on dialysis in general have a worse prognosis, and that's not only because uh, of kidney cancer. It's actually because dialysis causes a lot of physiologic issues in the body that lead to higher rates of heart disease and metabolic disturbances uh, that lead to a poor prognosis overall. So patients with dialysis tend to do worse than patients who don't need to be on dialysis. Um, and you know, one of the reasons why partial nephrectomy so partial removal of, kid, uh, of a kidney for the kidney cancer is considered is to try to uh, retain as much of the kidney function as possible so you can avoid patients going on dialysis. Um, but if they need dialysis, that we do aggressively uh, dialyze patients. Um, and like you mentioned, three times a week is kind of the standard. Um, one of the things that we consider for those patients is how to dose the drugs because um, these drugs, all the drugs that I've listed today are metabolized in different ways, some of them by the kidney. So the dosing may have to be adjusted for patients who are on dialysis. So we have to work closely with the dialysis team to make sure that they're getting right doses of the drug, that they're not at uh, risk for additional side effects and toxicities. So 
So if they have metastatic disease and they have to go on dialysis, then that is usually a terminal case. There are patients who have localized disease. So let's say if you have one, you're born with one kidney and you need it to be removed for the treatment of your cancer, but you don't have metastatic disease, then those patients are not terminal as far as their cancer is concerned. If you're able to cure them of their cancer by removing the kidney, unfortunately, they're gonna go on dialysis because they don't have any kidney function anymore, but those patients can be cured and in if for stage one and stage two patients, the majority of them are cured, and they may, they may live a very long time. But again, dialysis itself causes issues, so those, uh, those patients are at greater risk for dying. Again, this time, not because of kidney cancer, but because of being on dialysis. We know that those patients in general uh, uh, have uh, uh, medical comorbidities that arise from being on dialysis itself. So the question is, you know, are people given replacement kidneys um, for those patients who lose kidney function and are on dialysis? I mean, it kind of depends. I think um, if you are able to cure a patient with kidney cancer and you show that they're cancer-free for a number of years, that they would be eligible to receive a kidney. Patients with metastatic kidney cancer and really metastatic cancer that's known to be incurable are not usually uh, candidates for organ replacement of any kind. So if you have metastatic lung cancer, kidney cancer, whatever cancer, and it's known that it can't be cured, then those patients usually are not eligible for any kind of transplant, whether it's heart, kidney, liver, any of those things. And the reason is because those organs are scarce. So if you want to transplant somebody, you want to transplant people who are expected to be able to use those organs for a long time. A patient with metastatic kidney cancer or incurable kidney cancer who have a prognosis of a year or two are probably not the best use of those organs. Other questions? Great. Thank you for coming.